Hello and welcome to Path Breakers. Here on the show, we have Sanjeev Bikchandani and Dipinder Goyal to talk about what it takes to build a legacy. Stay tuned. I am Neha Bhotra. Sanjeev and Dipinder, thank you so much for joining us on Path Breakers. Uh, it's good to have both of you, the investor and the founder. So let's go back a couple of years to the time when you just IPO'd. I think many people do not know about the letter you wrote to Dipinder uh, before Zomato IPO'd on how to manage expectations. Could you tell us a bit about that letter? Akshant, the CFO, had written to us saying that, look, this is what how the book building is looking. Where do you think we should price the issue? And uh, I replied saying that, listen, obviously it's your call, but our recommendation is not be aggressive on the price. Make sure there's uh, enough left on the table for the incoming investors to also make money. Uh, at the same time, don't price it so low that the existing investors feel short change that you underpriced it. It's okay to leave something on the table. But look, you'll never get it right because you can't predict the market after the IPO. So we'll go with it. It was very general. I don't know. That's what I recall. Correct. Since you had walked that road, uh, did you share some words of advice with the Pinder on how ruthless the street can be when the performance is not as per the expectations of investors? Well. I did mention in that uh, communication that uh, in India, uh, it's bad karma if the retail investor gets hurt. So make sure the little guy does not get hurt. And that I believe that. After the company listed, uh, it wasn't a bed of roses. In fact, if anything, it was the perfect storm. The stock tanked below the issue price and you had some key exits from the company. Investors were exiting the stock. Did you take that as noise or was it a wake up call? How did you really you know, navigate that turbulence? I mean, I don't think it was any of those. It was not noise. It was not a wake up call as well because the fundamentals of the company needed work mm -hmm. and we were anyway working on those things. I would say uh, like more than noise, it was sort of pressure, right? So that, okay, do it like faster. If you're going to take a few quarters to do it, do it faster, do it sooner. I think it was a combination of these two things. We were already on a path. We just actually accelerated that path given everything that was happening. I think maybe the street was looking for some guidance, some uh, clarity. Because a retail investor is always very focused on the bottom line. And once you did put that out, I think it kind of calmed the jitters uh, quite a bit uh, on the street. See, I'll tell you one thing. It's one thing if your stock is correcting and uh, price is going down on its own. It's quite another if the market's going down and you're going down in line with the market. Now, what had happened in this case uh, was that the US tech stock market corrected. India followed after a few months. Zomato corrected accordingly. So it's not out of line of the market. Okay, It was in line of the market and therefore, actually, I don't think uh, there would have been that much pressure on account of stock price correcting. I think some words of advice I had received way back. We had listed in 2006, 2008 global financial crisis, 2009 our stock had corrected 75% from the peak. And I met this uh, gentleman in the US, I had gone on a visit to the US, who was CEO of a large American tech company and he said, Sanjeev, I'll give you a word of advice. Stock price goes up, you run the business. Stock price stays where it is, you run the business. Stock price goes down, you run the business. That's it. You did exactly that. I mean, after the adjusted vidda, you know, the last quarter profit numbers were very encouraging for the street. What do you think were some levers that actually helped you to accelerate? The business is actually very, very complex right now to be able to pinpoint a couple of things which led to these uh, kind of outcomes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say it was a combination of a lot of things and I mean in hindsight we also don't even really really know what worked and what didn't. We just continue to put in our best work, best effort every day mm -hmm. and fingers crossed after that. So Dipendra is saying he doesn't know what exactly worked but as an investor uh, when all this was happening you always had unwavering conviction. I remember speaking to you and asking you about Zomato and if you had a change of heart but you were always very steadfast in your confidence. What were the parameters that you were tracking? Actually, I wasn't really tracking anything. I just spoke to the Pinder once. I said, Sab kuch theek hai. Is it theek hai? I said, Fir theek hai. Look, the long term prospects of a company don't change just because the stock market corrects a bit or even substantially. Uh, you focus on the fundamentals. And I asked him, business theek hai. He said, business theek hai. Even if when senior exits happen, whatever happens, he just makes me one call like, Sab kuch theek hai. I said, haan, theek hai. And then said, cool. <laughs> so you have the confidence that if there's a bad news, you'll hear it first from Dipinder. Well, look, very often stuff appears, right? On social media, in print. If it gets a bit much, I call up and say, Dipinder, you know, anything. So when senior exits happen, I sort of did spend some time. And I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, I'm sure. When, oh, stock, when, when stock price corrected, I did not spend any time. 
when, when senior exits happened, I, I got concerned. And that is encouraging because uh, as an investor, you also have to answer to a board. How did you manage the expectations of the board at that point? Because they might have been on the edge a bit. No, it's a question of constant conversation. I think uh, our board has been, Infoage board has been very supportive of our investing strategy. We've got some things wrong, but what we've got right more than makes up for what we've got wrong. And so it's fine and things are going fine there. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, there's constant conversation about the portfolio. Food delivery has been a very important part of Zomato. It contributes over half of the revenue. How do you look at growth going forward for the food delivery business? I think we're at a very early stage in this business right now. And uh, I'm not just saying this for the sake of it, because in the US or China or most other markets, mm -hmm. people order food like 10 times more than what sure. they do here. So I think we have to get there. But actually what got us here may not get us there. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to innovate, we'll have to find new business models, maybe, I mean, we'll have to work with the restaurant industry differently. I don't know what it will take for us to get there. I mean, maybe the 20, 30, 40% year on year growth, I mean, seems slow, but I think it might actually go up if we do the right things. Of course, there's a lot of headroom. I mean, India would be close to $1 billion. If you look at China, it's $40 billion. But is it uh, strictly fair to compare India with China if you look at the per capita income, etc. But if somebody, if some country has traversed the journey earlier, it's useful to look at what happened there. Now, India may not be an exact parallel comparison. India may follow that path lower than China or faster than China or not follow that path at all. Those are things to analyze. But I think you'd, it's useful to have data from other countries. It just gives you the benchmark of what can be. Like, so India bypassed the landline era and just completely jumped to mobile phones. So we are just thinking of how can we make this transition happen faster. So that's our job. One strategy has been going into the smaller cities as well. How is that panning out for Zomato? What are you seeing on the ground in terms of demand from consumers? I think the demand from consumers is pretty much the same if we come to larger cities, smaller cities. The behavioral trends and patterns we're seeing are almost the same. <laughs> Uh, we just need to figure out how to uh, increase the frequency of the customer ordering from the platform from now onwards. Mm -hmm. So it's not about getting more customers to use the platform. It is about how do we get people to order more, order uh, more frequently people. going forward. What are some ways in which you are trying to do that? Can't tell you. It's <laughs> <laughs> moving on from food delivery. Um, the quick commerce business is a very important uh, lever for Zomato. Two years back when Zomato actually decided to full-time focus on the quick commerce business, uh, how did you respond as an investor? Because it would be taking on a significant amount of risk at a time when the boat wasn't very steady. So look, I head the investment committee on the board at Zomato. So the proposal came under the investment committee and quite honestly, you know, I was apprehensive. And I spoke to the Binder, I said, yeah, this loss-making company. Hai. I mean, if you can't turn it around, you know, we could be in a deep hole. Although there is money with tomato, but you don't want to burn all of it on, on something like this. And the main business is not profitable yet at a corporate level. And the market is asking for profits mm -hmm. in the main business and the whole company. Yeah. And nobody's going to profit here in this space. It's a very big bet. Are you sure? He said, I'm sure. I said, what makes you sure? And he said, look, I'm confident we can turn it around. I've looked at it close enough. I'm absolutely dead sure. And he explained how. And then we are still doubtful. Then he said, trust me. So we took that leap of faith. Uh, I think that faith has been borne out. Uh, it's truly remarkable what uh, has happened with Blinkit. To change the business model to quick commerce, to get to the margins they have, to get to profit as a company, to get to start approaching profit as, Blink, uh, as Blinkit standalone, uh, in such a short span of time, I think is truly remarkable and is great execution. Mm -hmm. Great execution. What did you do with the pin there? I think earlier there was a loss of 150 rupees per order. Now it's come down to 10, 15 rupees. How did you do that? Actually, I again, I don't know much. At our end, we say that we actually own Blinkit. We don't run it. I don't run it. And uh, all like credit to LB and his team. All the questions he was asking me at that time, and I was asking LB those mm -hmm. questions that hey, Sanjeev is asking those questions. So even the trust me was his line to me and because I had to back him, I said the same line to him. So it was me backing him and him backing me. So the chain sort of worked. So, but it's all credit to the Blinket team. We, we did nothing here.
that's a fair point. Did you change the way the dark rooms were working or was it some sort of a synergy you were able to draw? Zomato does have a very strong uh, understanding of delivery networks. So was that something that helped? I think, I mean, if I have to give one answer to this, I think that uh, Zomato culture is our moat, right? So, and people are really like in it and they really want to, they do the right things, they do the right long-term things in order to build the uh, like businesses that we do. So I, I, I think we sent over some of our best people to Grofers back then and Blinkit happened once the acquisition happened and that team figured it out because there was a lot of uh, residual knowledge in how Zomato was built and the kind of courageous calls that you had to take. I think all of those things work. It was primarily the team and then there were a million things which the team did in order to make this happen. Mm -hmm. But the main synergy was culture and team I would say. No one really saw the potential of the 10 minute delivery market. Everyone thought that, you know, you can always wait, you don't need it in 10 minutes and you've totally turned that around. Look, there were questions being asked, uh, you know, at the board itself. At least it'll be, a, it'll be a good promise to make in order to penetrate the market. But as it turned out, there is a segment of customers and that's large enough to support a business like Blinkit, which uh, does want it in 10 minutes, does want it last minute, does you know does not want to think that uh, and plan the pitch. Honestly, up to Zomato seems slow. I'm so used to Blinkit in 10. Zomato ke 30 minute lagte hai, this is so slow. I, why can't I do this faster? So I think there is going to be negative pressure on Zomato now because customers are not willing to wait for a 30, 40 minute period. In fact, you did say that it could be bigger in the food delivery business and uh, much, much faster, one tenth of the time, you said. What revenue do you think would be coming from the quick commerce business? I don't know. I mean, I think Blinkit, if I am right about the numbers, because they change very, very <laughs> fast. But I think Blinkit is about 40 to 50 percent of the size of Zomato right now. And in some cities, it's actually bigger than Zomato right now. It's growing three to four times faster. So I think it's a matter of some number of months before Blinkit becomes bigger than Zomato and we'll be super proud when it actually happens. Is there also a better business model around the 10 minute delivery because you're working with shorter distances? I think uh, quick commerce compared to any other commerce, the cost structures are very, very different. So the last mile is cheaper, but you have an extra added dark store cost. Yeah. You have other things which you need to um, add up. So the bet was that, okay, each store needs to get to about 1500 orders, 2000 orders per day. Only then this will make sense. And uh, we didn't know whether any of our stores would actually get get to that point. The only way we would get there in a shorter distance would if customers order way too frequently. Mm -hmm. Like on Zomato side, we have four times a month. Blinkit needed to be 10 times a month for us to get to that kind of frequency. And luckily, I mean, the uh, need for instant quick commerce is actually quite high. I mean, if you can get your headphones in a matter of seven, eight minutes, why would you wait for a day on Amazon? There's no point, right? And Blinkit is almost the same price or sometimes even cheaper than uh, Amazon. So, I mean, that's what people are choosing to do. And if you don't like it, you can send it right now. The returns are easy, right? So, I think quick commerce is overall a better uh, e-commerce model than the current uh, uh, e-commerce model. And at a certain throughput, it is actually cheaper than e-commerce to run as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the overall e-commerce segment uh, when you're talking well, about 10-minute delivery? I was skeptical about e-commerce as a sector. It's hard to make money. I think Blinkit has proved it wrong. Uh, and I think that's great. In one and a half years, huh? <laughs> <laughs> What's the early response you see in, you know, the tier two, tier three cities? We just started getting into tier two and tier three with Blinkit right now. Blinkit is a very new business, yes. right? One and a half years old. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just starting to and the initial signs are positive. Uh, but again, I mean, every new city is a new game and um, we'll see what happens. But initial signs look very, very positive right now. Many newcomers are coming in. Now you also have Flipkart entering the fray. They are making a re-entry of sorts. Will that change the equation for Blinkit? The fact that a much larger e-commerce company like Flipkart, the pioneer in uh, e-commerce in India, has decided to re-enter uh, tells us that this model is actually the future. And I think Zomato and Blinkit are well positioned to ensure that uh, they don't lose out on this. In fact, they win. You do have a moat around the food delivery business. What would you say is a competitive advantage for Blinkit when you have all this competition now seeing the opportunity and coming in? Some of them are established players that are seeing 
the big money that can be made here. So what would you say is an enduring competitive advantage for Blinkit? I think any competitive advantage that I say in terms of tactics, in terms of delivery fleet or anything, then that can be copied or paid for. So none of these things last beyond a point. I think the culture of the team and their mindset to innovate on a constant basis, that's the only mode. I mean, in the like businesses we do, anything right now gets copied in three months. So moats have to be, you have to create them every day. Like it's not something that lasts beyond a point. Actually, uh, there is a great advantage that Blinkit has, which is, I suspect, going to be durable. I think every organization has a strategic focus. The only thing Blinkit does is quick commerce. That's all they do. And they live 24 7 to do quick commerce. Now, if Flipkart or an Amazon or a much broader horizontal sort of e-commerce player also does quick commerce, then it remains an also. Mm -hmm. The strategic focus of the organization, what the brand means, and blink it means you, by the time you blink it comes. The brand itself means that, right? So the strategic focus of the organization of the brand, I think that is important. And that is what will lead to the culture and that is what will lead to the moat. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a business which is being led by a founder and like LB is one of the highest quality founders that I've ever met. So, I mean, that is also a strategic moat in the, long, in the longer term. Also, what are the synergies that you think can be tapped into between the food delivery business and Blinkit also? Um, we'll see. I mean, right now, we are separate uh, businesses, uh, both of them doing well. Uh, on their own, fingers crossed. Synergies will happen when there when there is a time for them. We don't do them for the like heck of it. So we'll see. So look, it's like this: when you're running a last mile logistics kind of business, a delivery kind of business, I think the speed cadence of the delivery matters a lot in how the organization works and what is focused on. Mm -hmm. So if Amazon and Flipkart are saying they deliver tomorrow, that's one kind of cadence and one kind of network and one kind of route planning and aggregation. Zomato on the other hand has to deliver in 35 minutes because I want my lunch when I'm hungry and I want it at lunchtime and I want to order it only now, right? That's different kind of cadence and therefore you have a much larger fleet of riders. Blink it, you want to deliver in 10 minutes, very locally. You it's can, a hyper local. You cannot the order from, very different. You cannot, you cannot order different. from Old Delhi, uh, you know, the, the way Zomato Legends has yes. and say, go, but there's a 40 minutes. <laughs> you know, yeah. nahi hota, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, the organization focus, uh, the cadence of the delivery process, the fleet, uh, the network, uh, all that is different. Now, for a Flipkart and Amazon to run two, one, against, one within the other, uh, may work, may not work, remains to be seen. Uh, for Zomato and uh, Blinkit to have, you know, synergies in delivery, mm -hmm. at least have the same guy deliver both or whatever, may or may not happen. Right? So don't expect it either. They have to exist independently and then if they find this energy is great. How about hyper pure and the food delivery business? Do you see ways of drawing synergies between these two? Hyper pure actually helps restaurants scale faster, easier. Mm -hmm. So when restaurants scale faster and easier, it helps our business in an like indirect way. But hyper pure also has a lot of synergies with Blinkit in terms of sourcing. Yes. These two organizations already do quite a lot of work with each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the kind of collaboration they do is only set to go up. Mm -hmm. So let's see, Hyperpure actually cuts both ways. So now when you look at where Zomato is, uh, what are some new adjacencies that you feel they can tap into? Because there's also a lot of money that Zomato has, 10,000 odd crore. So what adjacencies do you think could make sense? Uh, so I think, I think uh, actually the Blinkit business uh, has a lot of potential to grow. So rather than diversify, um, I mean, all this is to be discussed but, uh, and agreed upon, but uh, I think the Blinkit business alone can deliver growth for the next decade or so, which is uh, really, really big, right? Along the way, if some adjacency comes up, uh, maybe they look at it. But right now, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we're just focused on Blinkit. More than our hands and feet full right now with what we have. <laughs> so over time, will uh, Blinkit be like 55 and the others will be the balance 45 in terms of revenue contribution? Let's see. More than that, perhaps. I hope everything that we have is 55 in terms of the contribution <laughs> to the business. Look, the grocery market daily needs, okay, is much, much larger than ordering in from restaurants. So that market size alone will probably propel Blinkit uh, to a significant size and scale and possibly larger than Zomato. 
but there are the other points of view that okay quick commerce within like grocery may not scale that much so we don't know i think the trends are looking good uh, but um, how they scale beyond that i mean will only time will tell is this a business where having deep pockets uh, has uh, a material advantage for the company i think it gives confidence uh, and if you need to burn a lot of capital for a few years then obviously it's required but in this case i think they managed to do it without burning too much money exactly but if they didn't have this money even the bank and they were not listed there's no way they'd done it yeah we would have not. we would not have the courage to do it i think the capital in the bank gave us the courage to do it but we didn't also have to take short term calls in order to get to the point where we got to so far and i think the compounding of consistently taking long term calls took us like brought us here in general when we don't have money in the bank it forces us to take short term calls that doesn't work for the short term as well as for the long term so i think it gave us the patience which helped like you've been through those phases to know i think yeah, yeah, five yeah. six times <laughs> when you had a runway of just a couple of months. i think i think there were two near death experiences Uh, 2015 I and 2020. 2015, yes, the downturn. Uh, maybe there were more. I didn't tell you about. That. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think COVID, the beginning of COVID, was tough. Also. Now, when you look back, actually, what do you uh, during the beginning of COVID, I called him. Since he five million dollars only, I need. Else, we will sh- like shut down. He said, he said, I don't have time for this. <laughs> figure it out yourself, man. And then I did, <laughs> and it worked. So. How did you figure it out? I mean, took took the right calls. Uh, I mean, uh, thought out of the box. In fact, we asked our uh, entire team to opt in for salary cuts. Mm-hmm. Voluntarily, about eighty percent of the organization took salary cuts. Without, we didn't force anyone. There was no rule, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean that gave us a couple of months extra. And then those couple of months extra, we figured out more answers. So we mm-hmm. kept on pushing month by month, and we survived. So, so beginning of COVID, that quarter, Nokri billing growth was minus forty three percent Y O Y. So you know we also had our own issues to solve for, and uh, the board had told me, "Listen, your hundred million dollar fund is now fifty million dollars. We are reducing the commitment." I was only asking for five million dollars. <laughs> Come on, but thank you. It was nice that you actually didn't give us the five. Do you think that enterprise actually comes out during times of frugality? So many startups have actually turned the corner when this entire funding crunch no, happened. Absolutely, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> Especially 20 years back, you know, you didn't have this kind of VC funding, and yet you had startups. You know, actually, not as many as you have today, but uh, yes, you had startups. We have more startups today, but I think uh, the last few quarters have kind of corrected. Well, actually, you'll be quite surprised to see how many profitable startups are there now, and how many are getting closer to profit. There will be some that will have a problem, and they might flame out, and they might consolidate or whatever. But there are. to my mind several hundred profitable startups in india today i don't have an exact count but there'll be several hundred what sense do you get when you interact with many of the young entrepreneurs or what advice do you give to them i think um, there is a lot of people they actually want to do startups now earlier it was a second option or the third option and uh, nowadays like starting a company is one of the first options people think of uh, people are not as risk averse that they used to be and i think people are saying okay Four years of my life. If I try this, I'm not going to die. And the worst case is I will learn. So I think I think that kind of mindset is something that I'm seeing quite a lot, which is leading to the growth in the number of startup that we see. I think the one advice I would have is something that he gave me was the only way you lose is if you quit, and if you don't quit and you survive long enough. then you end up winning survival is the only goal i mean even if right now let's say we are theoretically going through good times we're still fighting to survive so earlier we used to fight to survive the next 6 months now we fight to survive the next couple of years let's say so if you're always looking to survive then you if you are like there long enough you end up winning Sanjeev, what about you? When you interact with young entrepreneurs, uh, what advice do you give them? You've seen so many cycles. I have always said, and uh, I maintain, the customer's money is better than the investor's money because if you're getting the customer's money uh, and you're getting it repeatedly from the same customer at a price that's higher than your cost, chances are you have a viable business so long as you can get enough customers. Investors love to invest behind businesses that are getting the customer's money. On the other hand, if you get the investor's money first, there's no guarantee you'll get the customer's money, right? Now, a lot of the advice, uh, you know, from the year 2010 to 2000 and 
21, people didn't regard very highly simply because there was an abundance of capital available and you had the option of raising your way out of trouble. It's when the funding environment tightened that people said that, okay, I mean, now it's pretty much par for the course. You said that mentors are those giants who stand on their shoulders and you can look far ahead than you would otherwise. Uh, who has been one mentor who you have drawn inspiration and strength from? I mean, he has continuously been one and uh, I mean, over time, different years, different kind of people, depending on what kind of situation I was in. You, Sanjeev, no, when so you I, started... I, I, no, I want to add something here. <laughs> See, it's like this. And what I always tell our own team, that the secret of successful early stage investing is to invest behind teams and founders and companies who are going to succeed anyway, with you or without you. So. If you think that uh, if we had not invested in Zomato or FoodieB then, they would not have succeeded? Of course not, they would have succeeded anyway. If you think that Policy Bazaar would not have succeeded without our money, that's not true, they would have succeeded anyway. So our job, I tell, keep telling our investing team, is yeah, just find the guys who are going to succeed anyway. You as investors, you are there for the long haul and you take an interest in the operational side as well, which I have seen many VC investors aren't very focused upon. Is that also an element that makes a difference? Uh, let me put it this way. I think people like us who have run businesses mm. and people who are financial investors both add value. We add different kinds of value, but both are needed. So if you talk to some of our companies which we invested in, they tell us that, listen, uh, the conversations we have with you are slightly different from the conversations we have with the financial investors. So we will go more into operations by sales system, kaisa hai, incentive plan, kya hai. Hiring kaise ho rahi hai? Do you want us to interview? Come and talk to operating teams. See, call center kaise chalta hai? Come and see. You know, all of those things because we're doing it ourselves. The financial investors bring different kind of value because they actually have to do much more rigorous uh, analysis, uh, financial analysis, financial modeling. They probably have networks with other investors in the valley overseas, which we may not have. So I think both are needed and both are useful. But here is Dipinder who's raised money from all sorts of people. Uh, and he can give you a better idea of... Please do the pin there. Uh, what kind of idea? Are you going to make me like get murdered by one of the camps? <laughs> but no, no, be honest, the pin there. No, I think everybody has their own value. And uh, at the end of the day... Okay, so let me actually rephrase this. Most of the times, the advice that you get from a specific person is generally the same or more of the same. Investors especially, like financial investors especially. They know 10 of the right things to say. They're, I'm not saying they're wrong but they are generally those same things. But there is also a form and context fit. Like all those things don't fit into all contexts of all the businesses. So when we get advice from financial investors, mm. it's right as a like general rule, but it doesn't always apply to us. So we have to filter out a lot. But when we talk to somebody like InfoEdge, we have to filter out less. So that's the difference between these two. I do understand that against a very disruptive background and black swan events, it's hard to have manual operation plans because you have to be agile, you have to be flexible. At the same time, you are looking at uh, $1 billion over the next five, six years. What are some levers you will use to get there? We don't have a goal, actually. Uh, we don't put any targets for any of our teams. And we just expect all our people to put in their best work. I think as uh, the last few quarters have shown, the best work generally yields better outcomes than the best projections or the best targets we could have put out. Because my uh, belief is that if you put a target, people would only work up to that target and stop there. They would never think, can, can I be, do beyond the target? But if you have the right team on board, I mean, there's no point giving them a target. Just like let them set them free and they'll do the best that they can. So let's put it this way. $17 billion, $200 billion projection in the next five, six years. How do you want to scale that? I mean, people will scale it. The team will scale it on its own. <laughs> it you are the CEO, I have to ask you. <laughs> my thing, my job is not the CEO, it's the chief HR person. Like, that's more of my job than being the CEO. And... My job is to make sure that we have the right people at the right like places and uh, I'm helping them, I'm coaching them in order to do their jobs better. Like I can't do everything myself. But some levers that will give you an advantage? 
I don't know. I mean, to be very honest, we actually figure them out every single day. I mean, things go wrong. Things go well. Things go well right now. One year from now, they don't work. So, I mean, it's about being. I, I think one of the levers would be to keep your eyes open and just listen to the customer and see what they're saying. If the business scales five to seven x with enough gas in the tank for future growth, uh, that's when they'll get the valuation. They don't chase valuation, they chase business and business growth and that's how all good companies run. Now, whether they'll get to 5 to 7x in the next 5 to 7 years, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, we don't even know the revenues that we will get. I don't even know our current revenue as an absolute number right now. I only know last quarter kidney growth, I think. Right? So, I only know growth numbers. I don't know the absolute numbers at all. And I think the whole team is wired like that. What do you think would be a sweet spot when it comes to growth? Doubling year on year would be lovely. <laughs> Sanjeev, you've been invested in Zomato since uh, 2010. In fact, you did four solo rounds as well. Um, what next? I mean, will you always be invested in Zomato? Look, I, we are a listed company, right? I can't commit that. Uh, would I like to stay invested in Zomato uh, as long as there's growth and value creation to be left? The answer is obvious. Obvious. Whether yes. we will or we won't depends on the info board. And yeah, it's periodically reviewed. Mm-hmm. And uh, we take it from there. But, you know, like I said, Zomato management just executes, plans, strategy executes. They don't plan for market cap. And market cap to market data. Market cap, market ke mood pe hai. Like, roz roz does this person swing hote hai, and that's got nothing to do with us. The classic example is the Flipkart headline just last week, and markets reacted to that. But I wasn't looking at it from a valuation perspective. I wanted to understand it from profitability as well. What the path is going to be in the coming years. We hope we get to the right level of profits. And I really mean right because we don't want to continue maximizing profits all the time, right? Because um, we work in a marketplace and we have to balance the interests of everyone. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, we will maintain profitability. I think Zomato is pretty much very close to that point where the maintain maintain will start Mm -hmm. and uh, Blinkit will get there in a couple of years maybe. Mm -hmm. There has been no cash burn when it comes to the quick commerce business, but given the dynamics in the market, do you think that this could be something we need to resort to if competition does it? I mean, so far it doesn't look like we will need to do that, but um, the dynamics, um, the market dynamics change overnight. The food delivery business, for instance, you know, when you had your closest competitor doing that kind of cash burn, like it or not, Zomato had to walk that path. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, depends on uh, somebody wanting to start doing this. So. And you no. will follow. <laughs> no, if we have let, to, me, we let, me, let, let me put it this way. <laughs> uh, the fact that Zomato uh, has a couple of billion dollars in the bank, okay, will hopefully encourage others to rethink any strategy of uh, predatory pricing, knowing fully well that Zomato has this kind of gas in the tank. Mm -hmm. And that will enforce rational behavior on everybody's part. What would be some milestones that you would want Zomato to achieve in the next five years? I don't have any. Not quantitative, qualitatively, if there would be some benchmarks you aspire for. No, I mean, I I think like culturally, I think if it would be super cool if we have a a team of potential CEOs. Like like I mean, if we can get to a bench of four or five people who are ready to run large businesses on by like themselves, mm-hmm. like LB quality CEOs, it would be super cool to get to that point. So, I think look, any most operating entrepreneurs uh, of what they salt will say, "Mere log khush hai, mere log kabil hai, committed hai." That's achievement number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, my customer khush hai. In this case, restaurant partner, are they benefiting from Zomato? Are they making money? Are the customers happy? Are we doing all of this at reasonable economics? Mm-hmm. And are we market leaders? And are we known to be a well-governed, excellent company? Uh, are shareholders happy? These four parts of public ko khush karna hai. Thank you so much, Sanjeev Bichandani and Dipinder Goyal for speaking with us, joining us on Pathbreakers. Thank you so much, Thank you.